the Lenape and Nanticoke tribes, the people who were driven away from their homeland when the British conquered the New World, Solomon Stanger and his family, the glass blowers who settled in South Jersey to start their own glass factory, Colonels Thomas Heston and Thomas Carpenter, the duo who revived the glass factory after the Stanger's financial downfall, Hannah Heston, the widow who ran the glass works while raising a large family. Welcome to Glassboro. not waiting. Pine, oak, sand, clay. The only change happening slowly. Growth of new flora, death of old, spring giving way to summer before cold settled in. Change was predictable, leisurely, mild, until it became a tempest. indigenous people of southern New Jersey were the Lenape. The Lenape homeland extends as far north up into southeastern New York, um, uh, southwestern Connecticut, all of New Jersey, the eastern portion of Pennsylvania along the Delaware River, and northern Delaware. There were these main hubs where many of the trails, the footpaths, coalesced, connected, and that was an area of trade. It was an area, actually, after colonization, an area of refuge. Fifty miles around the peninsula's eastern side, at the mouth of Big Timber Creek, banks 30 Dutch families on a ship named Joyful Message. Their captain, Cornelius Jacobson May of the West India Company, the namesake of Cape May, and one of many early Dutch navigators to dub this land New Netherland. His colony is the first on this side of the river. One of our Nanticoke chiefs is recorded as saying that for every one white person that got off one of the ships, nine of our people died. And so uh, there are some records indicating that as much as 90% of our population died within the first several generations of contact from disease and hostile conflict. The history does speak for the fact that that early contact was less hostile with the Swede than it was with the Dutch. The Dutch, Dutch were here more for trading purposes, for commercial purposes, and uh, we would hunt and we would use all of the animal, but just to hunt for the skin to be sold was a new thing. So we began to see the depletion of natural resources. For years, the Dutch skirmished with the Swedes, but in the end, they surrender to the Lord High Admiral of the King's Navy, the brother of King Charles II. The crown ascends and gives its prize the name New Jersey. Among the land acquired is what will, in time, become Glassboro. The fact of the matter is that our people never in our minds sold the land to the extent that we no longer had any right to it. And so for many of those who came from Europe, the initial gifts they gave, they assumed was payment for the land. Whereas for us, 
It was more like the agreement that we'll share that needs to be renewed on a regular basis. And so that led to quite a bit of conflict. Well, most Lenape left the region. Most Nanakoke left the region. Uh, it began moving further westward, further northward. It, it was a, a painful tearing away from the land. We, we had to learn new ways to survive and perpetuate our, our people in, into the future. And we did, but it's, it's been a difficult journey, a journey that's left a lot of scars. Betsy Banks in Philadelphia. Cast off from Holland, she arrives carrying, among over 100 aboard, three generations of one German family. Although women and children are omitted, the name Stanger is scattered across the manifest of passengers. The family had worked at their own glass factory, but the looming uncertainty in then Prussia moved them to action. The Stangers, like so many others, looked to the New World, and the New World, requiring the skills of European artisans, looked to them. Unable to sell their factory, the Stangers abandoned their home to start anew at Wisterburg. Well, Wisterburg Glass Manufacturing was the first successful glass factory in America, and it started in 1739 in Alloway, over in Salem Township, right near um, the Delaware River. Uh, Casper Wister came from an area in Germany outside the Black Forest, which is where the German glass tradition uh, really resides. He immigrated over to America, um, where he uh, resided in Philadelphia. He got a start as a brass button maker over here, but he was also neighbors with Benjamin Franklin. and. Um, he was going down through South Jersey, and he recognized that the natural landscape was much like it was where he came from in Germany. We have a lot of sand, and our sand is particularly good for, for glass because it melts evenly. It have, we have a lot of trees, and trees are used both for the ash to make potash, which is an ingredient in glass, as well as to fuel the furnaces. We're near the bay where there are oysters, and the oysters can be used to make lime, the third key ingredient in glass. And we're also on waterways, which was key for shipping the goods out of the glass factory to Philadelphia, New York, Boston for sale. Oh, so as I mentioned, his neighbor in Philadelphia is Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin's son was the governor of New Jersey when it was under the crown. And so uh, between the Franklins, they were able to write letters to the crown that minimized the glass factory. Um, so that they wouldn't get in trouble for having manufacturing here in the colonies, which was forbidden by the British. After Caspar Wister's death in 1752, his son Richard hires on the Stanger family. Labor conditions in the factory are grueling. Many workers run away, including Stanger brother Jacob, who even earns a notice in the paper with a $20 reward for capture. A list of workers at a rival establishment in Lancaster shows that Solomon Stanger may have deserted Wisterburg in 1774. Solomon desires a share in the American promise himself and for 11 years saves his earnings for his dream. Solomon Stanger negotiates 200 acres of land for 700 pounds purchased from a man named Jacob Gosling. Solomon Stanger is often credited as being um, the founder of what later became Glassboro, but I'm not really sure if that's, that's really fair because when you really think about it, um, the entire family um, decided to, to immigrate to the, the New World. Um, you know, I think it's reasonable to think that, that as a family, they put all their funds in it together um, to make it happen, um, but I also think that that it was likely that the family pulled all their funds together in order to purchase this land. So Catherine Stanger was the mother of Solomon and his brothers. Catherine and her husband Jacob, when they were about 51 years old when they, when they immigrated to the New World. I think it's safe to presume that Catherine and, and Jacob actually had a big influence on the family um, immigrating because without their influence, um, 
you know, the family wouldn't have, wouldn't have made it to New Jersey, wouldn't have founded Glassboro, New Jersey. Joined by the remnant workers of Failing Wisterberg, Solomon and Daniel opened the so-called Glass Works in the Woods by 1781 as equal shareholders. They built 12 log cabins, and the church in Swedesboro agrees to provide them with a minister, eventually growing into the village's own Episcopalian church, St. Thomas's. I wouldn't say that the Stangers prospered. Um, they actually struggled quite a bit. They weren't, you know, experienced um, business people, especially um, in the type of business that happened in the colonies. A change in currency after the revolution means that the paper money the Stangers had dealt in is now worthless. So my understanding is, is that the Stanger family were forced to sell. I don't know if the property was sold directly to um, Thomas Heston and Thomas Carpenter. Um, it might have first gone through the local government, I'm not really sure. But eventually, Thomas Carpenter and um, uh, Thomas Heston were owners of the property. Thomas Carpenter is born in Salem, New Jersey. He descends from devout Quaker Samuel Carpenter, a Philadelphia settler, once the wealthiest landowner in Pennsylvania, aside from William Penn. Thomas grows into an affable and keenly intelligent man, and like his ancestor, is deeply rooted in his spirituality. Thomas Heston, one year his junior, will one day be Carpenter's nephew through both of their marriages. Raised in Philadelphia, also in a Quaker household, he becomes a favorite of the exclusive Gloucester Fox Hunting Club, frequently visiting the Death of the Fox Inn in South Jersey. Thomas Heston is dismissed from a meeting of the Society of Friends in Philadelphia for assuming a warlike appearance and associating with others in training to learn the art of war. He had volunteered for the Philadelphia Militia, joining the ranks of Captain Joseph Copperthwaite, commander of the Quaker Blues, of which the members had all shunned the ideals of their religion. He fights alongside George Washington in the battles of Trenton and Princeton and continues service under Colonel Jacob Morgan in the 3rd Battalion, 8th Company of the Philadelphia Militia earning the rank of colonel. Wishing to help but not to fight, Thomas Carpenter is commissioned as paymaster in Salem and Gloucester, eventually becoming a quartermaster, a rank equal to colonel. After uh, the revolution, more glassworks started to open, but really what happened is, is South Jersey became a stronghold of glass making. You know, we didn't have, to, we weren't under the British rule anymore, so we could manufacture our own goods. Um, we were able to um, invest internationally, and so that gave capital to people here to be able to open glass factories. The Gloucester Fox Hunting Club reconvenes, and perhaps it is during one of those rendezvous to South Jersey that Thomas Heston is introduced to the Stanger Small Venture. By 1786, he and Thomas Carpenter are the principal owners. So my understanding is Thomas Heston was in charge of the factory, which was located um, on what is now State Street, um, basically right across the street from where um, the Landmark Restaurant is at. Back behind a couple houses, there's an open area, um, and that's where the factory was located. So Thomas Heston actually managed uh, the factory, and he also managed the inn that was there. And uh, Thomas. Carpenter um, actually managed the, uh, the transportation of the product. I think a good part of the business end of the, uh, the selling of the items, the transportation of the items. The partners contribute to new roads and bridges. The land thrives. After a day of hunting, the name Glassboro is pitched among the din and chatter of the death of the Fox Inn. So the story goes. So it, it seems that the Stanger sons did continue to work in the glass factories for many, many years. Um, I don't have specifics on, on, on um, 
how many of them and, and who specifically worked for Heston Carpenter. Um, but but I, I do know that the family in general continued working in glass. Here rest in God Solomon Stanger was born on the 28th of March, 1743, and passed the wretched world on the 19th of July, 1794. And so his age broke to 51 years, three weeks, and six days. After Solomon's passing, the Stanger family continues to contribute to the expansion of the glassmaking industry. In the 1800s, the Union, Harmony, Malaga, Temperanceville, and the Isabella Glassworks are all born and shortly after die in the hands of the Stanger descendants. Died on Wednesday, October 13, 1802, Colonel Thomas Heston at his country seat in Glassboro, New Jersey, after a short illness which he bore with Christian fortitude and resignation. In the death of this excellent man, the Army has lost a brave soldier, society a valuable monument, religion and liberty deprived a sincere and strong support, the widow of an affectionate companion, his children a pious and tender father. Thomas Carpenter retires, passing his stake in the glassworks to his son Edward. My understanding is, is that um, Heston actually ran um, the tavern for, I don't know, 10 years. Um, and then after he passed away, his, his wife, uh, Hannah, Hannah, Hannah Clayton Heston, um, she ran um, the, both the tavern and the glassworks for many, many, many years. And I think, I think she passed away in 1840, 42, uh, which would mean that she ran, ran the factory um, or was basically, in, you know, financially invested in the in the factory and the the tavern um, for 40 plus years. And she was able to do all that, manage the tavern, and manage the glassworks for some time, while she had seven children to raise. That's a pretty amazing uh, thing she did. It's a story that really needs to be told. Because Hannah Hannah raised um, children that ended up um, um, being really involved with the Glassboro community. Glassboro, the original inhabitants of the land were the Lenape and Nanticoke. They, along with the Dutch and the Swedes, were driven out by the ever hungry crown. A century later, the Stanger family's hope, grit, and artisanry brought community to a wild patch of woods and when they lost it all, the witting colonels Heston and Carpenter put the town on the map. But this was only the beginning. A storm was brewing off the coast, and the man it washed up was a harbinger of change.